Welcome to today's webinar on historical perspectives of the 2006 report of the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. My name is Anya Lee and I am the Assistant Dean of the College for the first year and sophomore experience. And we are excited to announce that uh, this text has been selected as this year's first readings. Before we get to our presenters, I'd like to introduce Dean Rashid Zia who will share some brief opening remarks. Dean Zia. Thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm especially grateful to the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice for helping organize this event and to our speakers, Professor Bogues and Professor Campbell. This webinar is the first public event this year connected with the 2020 First Readings Program. So I thought it would be helpful to provide a brief overview of that program. At Brown, the First Reading is designed to serve as an introduction to our shared learning community. It is an opportunity to come together as a class and as a campus to explore one text in detail so that we may have a common touchstone from which to begin and return throughout your studies. In this context, I am grateful that the 2020 First Readings Committee selected the report of the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. Published in 2006, this report examines the university's relationship to slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. And it asks direct questions about how communities and institutions can address and repair injustice. For context, this report was nominated last fall by two dozen students and selected by the committee in March before the tragic deaths of George Floyd and countless others brought renewed attention to the continuing legacy of anti-Black violence in the United States. I can think of no more appropriate reading to help us define a shared understanding of place and purpose before we convene in per person on College Hill. The stories that we choose to share with one another help to define our understanding of place and purpose. Equally important though, are the stories that go untold and unspoken. Myself growing up in Rhode Island, my classmates and I were taught that the American Industrial Revolution began in Pawtucket Slater Mill, just miles upriver from our campus. On elementary school trips, we were taken to see how water powered these first textile mills. And from middle school onward, we learned how the early textile industry was essential to our state's economy. Each morning on my bus ride to my public high school, I remember a narrow street where we passed a small reservoir on the right and a large 19th century mill building on the left. As students, we were taught that this mill was important to the history of our town particularly the village of Peacedale. But our history lessons were silent about the specific textiles made there and their deep connection to slavery in the United States. As you'll see in the report, this was a connection explored in detail by Susan Oba, Brown class of 2006. One of the undergraduate researchers whose work informed the committee's report and also became the product of her senior honors thesis entitled mostly made especially for this purpose in Providence, Rhode Island, the, Negro, the Rhode Island Negro cloth industry. In reading the report on slavery and justice, you'll have an opportunity to learn this story and others, and importantly, to revisit histories that you may have thought were settled. Reading this text will be challenging, especially this year as our nation comes to grips with centuries of systematic injustice and anti-Black violence and especially for those who've experienced this injustice and violence firsthand. As a community of students and scholars, it is our obligation, particularly those who have not shared these experiences, to seek out learning and share knowledge. The painful truth is that the narratives most commonly shared about our nation's history often overlook the pervasive, persistent, and insidious nature of slavery and racial injustice. In the words of the report authors, we cannot change the past, but an institution can hold itself accountable for the past, accepting its burdens and responsibilities along with its benefits and privileges. One of our greatest privileges as members of the Brown community is our ability to, is our ability to, uh, to study and reflect upon the past as expressed in Brown's liberal learning goals. Coming to terms with history involves far more than learning names and dates and events. 
It means understanding the problematic nature of evidence and of the distance that separates the present from the past. It also means thinking critically about how histories themselves are written and who has the power to write them. It is our hope that studying the past together provides us with an invaluable opportunity to better understand the present and that reflecting on the meaning of accountability, justice and repair can help us to transform our collective future. With that, it is my privilege to introduce two scholars whose research, whose research and writing produced this report and who both served on the steering committee on slavery and justice. Professor Anthony Bogues is the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, as well as Professor of Africana Studies and of the History of Art and Architecture at Brown University. He has also served since 2012 as the founding director of the Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Professor James Campbell is the Edgar E. Robinson Professor in United States History at Stanford University. Professor Campbell chaired the Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice during this time when he was the Professor of Africana Studies, American Civilization, now American Studies, and History at Brown. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Campbell. I wanna take you back. Uh, it doesn't seem that long ago when you reach the age of people like Professor Bogues and me, but it's probably at about the time when all of you entering the freshman class were being born to the early 20th century or the early 21st century, a century that was not uh, reeling from a pandemic or reeling from the police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others, but which was nonetheless uh, a very divisive political time. It was the era of 9-11 and the war on terror. It was a disputed presidential election. And it was also, as so often in American history, a fraught period in what we call race relations. One of the central issues of that time was a debate, a raging national debate over reparations for slavery. The idea that uh, somehow people descended of people who had for 246 years labored as slaves were entitled to some compensation in the present. There were in fact talk, there was talk at that time and they were eventually filed of the filing of class action lawsuits by descendants of enslaved people against corporations uh, alleged to have profited from slavery and slave related industries. And among those institutions that was explicitly targeted by reparations advocates was Brown University as well as Harvard and Yale. In this context, a conservative columnist named David Horowitz used the occasion of February of Black History Month to send to a variety of college newspapers, including the Brown Daily Herald, a paid advertisement, 10 reasons why reparations for slavery is a bad idea and racist too. I mean, no disrespect to Mr. Horowitz, who is a noted conservative provocateur, when I suggest that I think the ad was intended less to provoke thoughtful dialogue and discussion of the complex issue of reparations, rather than to provoke a response. It suggested, for example, that African American people should be grateful for slavery because they were so much better off by virtue of having been brought to America, that they were ungrateful to the white Christian people who had freed them, that reparations for slavery had already been paid by the fact that so many black people were on welfare, and that any remaining disparities between black and white people in the United States uh, were not a function of an institution that in the original draft, he said, had ended hundreds of years ago, that wasn't true, but simply were reflections of Black people's own individual deficiencies of character. Well, if Mr. Horowitz was indeed hoping to provoke a response from students, he hit the jackpot at Brown University, where a group of students came together and demanded that the Brown Daily Herald retract the ad and return the $75 that had been paid for the ad. When the editors refused, the students announced that they would prevent the Brown Daily Herald from circulating. Now, I don't know if you can steal something that's free, but the next day, a group of students showed up at the distribution points of the Brown Daily Herald 
and made off with a day's press run of the paper. Well, as I say, I think Mr. Horowitz hit the jackpot. I also think it was a rather bad day for Brown. The next day, Brown was on the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Christian Science Monitor, the London Times, not making that up, a paper in New Zealand, I forget which one, uh, was on MSNBC, Fox News, you can imagine. In fact, Fox News ran 21 stories about this. Um, Brown cited as an example of a campus uh, that had become so politically correct that when students were confronted with ideas that challenged their beliefs, they had no response but to smash the presses. Now, as it happens, Brown had a short time before appointed a new president, Ruth Simmons who on her accession to the presidency in the summer of 2001 became the first black woman, indeed the first African-American person at all, to be president of an Ivy League university. Given the fraught conditions of the reparations debate, and it really was fraught, a public opinion poll at that time found that the slavery reparations issue was the most divisive racial issue ever surveyed in American history. Depending on how you ask the question, something on the order of half of African-American people believe that they are entitled to some recognition and compensation in light of the two and a half centuries of unrequited and unremunerated toil of their ancestors. But when you ask that question to white Americans, 95% of white Americans were opposed. I mean, I defy you to find any other issue where you would find that level of fierce unanimity the Americans. In that context, one might have imagined that Professor Simmons would give the reparations issue a very wide berth, not only because of the likelihood that anything that was said publicly would end up in litigation, but also because of her conspicuous presence, not only as the first African American person to head an Ivy League university, but the fact that she herself was a grandchild of people who had been enslaved. She chose exactly the opposite tack. In her first convocation speech at Brown in 2001, you can find it on the web and I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's the most remarkable speech I have ever heard. She took the controversy the previous spring over the reparations ad as her subject. Now there is a convention at Brown, alas, you haven't experienced it yet, I hope you will. The Van Wickle gates at the front of the, of the main green are always locked, they open twice. They open inward at convocation and the freshman class processes in. And four years later, they open outward so that the graduating class can process out. She pointed to those gates in her speech through which the freshman class had just processed and told the students assembled that if they believed that they had been brought to Brown University to shield them from ideas that made them uncomfortable, the gates were not yet locked, please get up and leave now. But she also said, I hope you will stay. And I hope you will join in the form of loving combat that is a university. She followed that up even more remarkably by appointing a committee, the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice. She asked that committee to organize public programs that would help students and the nation think in reasoned, rigorous ways about the complex political, legal, ethical, and moral questions raised by the question of reparations for slavery. Reparations, she said in a letter announcing the committee, was a difficult, complicated subject about which people of goodwill would disagree. But it was also an issue on which Brown, by virtue of its particular history, had a special opportunity and obligation to provide national leadership. Which points to a second dimension of the charge the committee received from President Simmons. We were also instructed to investigate and disclose Brown and its founders historical relationship to slavery in the transatlantic slave trade. Now that may surprise you, it certainly surprised many people in the early 2000s we have been conditioned in this country to imagine slavery as this anomalous institution that existed in some Southern states before being taken away in the inevitable march of human progress. It was not the case. 
Slavery existed in all 13 main North American mainland colonies, indeed in every New World colony, and for a time in all 13 original states. The population of Providence at the time the college moved here was about 12% enslaved, one in eight people. Rhode Island also played a leading role in the North American portion of the transatlantic slave trade. Of those ships that were North American in origin that carried enslaved people from Africa, about 60% of them, that is to say about a thousand voyages in all, came from tiny Rhode Island. Rhode Island indeed had its own distinctive triangular trade in which sugar and molasses produced by enslaved people in the West Indies were carried to Rhode Island where they was distilled into rum. Newport alone at the time of the American Revolution had 24 rum distilleries, which was then carried to West Africa to trade for more captive people to be carried to the West Indies to produce more sugar, more rum, and more slaves. The announcement of the committee in that fraught racial moment was greeted with to say the least, mixed responses. You can see excerpts of the various programs. No, we had over hundred speakers come to campus, a calendar of events, related documents. Uh, here's an example of one of the responses we received. Uh, this is an effort you know, with potential for conflict, embarrassment and discord, but few issues in the US society are so important and you deserve great credit for taking this on. This response was rather more typical. You disgust me as you discussed of many other Americans. Slavery was wrong, but at that time it was a legal enterprise. It ended, case closed. Goes on to say, you don't deserve money. You deserve a boot in the backside over and over. Can your ignorant research and can Ruth Simmons too. I dare say, as you read this, that black people can't get off drugs or guns, can't move forward, can't get over welfare, uh, that the sentiments being expressed here suggest that uh, slavery and its legacy persist and that the case was indeed very far from closed. I'm pleased and proud to say that the, the reservations expressed about the committee when we started were largely dissipated by the time we finished our work a couple of years later. And indeed, Brown was hailed almost universally as a university that had actually reminded American people of what a university was, that universities were precisely designed to be places which would fearlessly investigate the most critical and controversial uh, elements, questions, in society and do so in ways that were reasoned and rigorous. Today, more than 80 other American universities have embarked on uh, investigations modeled on the Brown Committee, including Yale, Harvard, University of Virginia, University of Maryland, Princeton, Penn, Emory, the list just goes on and on. As part of our work, one of the things that we did was we went into Stanford's, or, or excuse me, I've moved to Brown's archives. Uh, we found extraordinary things. We were able to identify some 30 members of the Brown Corporation, the governing body of Brown University, what was at the time the College of Rhode Island, who had owned or captained slave ships. We found records of student debating societies where students at Brown, your predecessors, debated the morality of the transatlantic slave trade. And we also found some 200 manuscript pages of a single slaving voyage, the Brigantine Sally, which was dispensed to the West, dispatched to the West Coast of Africa by the Brown brothers, Nicholas, Joseph, John, and James. Uh, I'm sorry, Moses, in 1764, the same year that the College of Rhode Island was founded. In closing, I just want to show you a few of these documents. You can find them all on the web, and the voyage of the Sally is described in more detail in the report, which I hope you will be reading. This beautiful document, it's a print document, as you can see, is a bill of lading, which outlines those 
items shipped by the grace of God in good order by Nicholas Brown and company on the Brigantine Sally for the west coast of Africa, including 17,274 gallons of high proof New England rum. This is the articles people sign on to ships. You can see that the master of the ship, Isaac Hopkins, there is an Isaac Hopkins Park in Providence. There used to be an Isaac Hopkins Middle School. Isaac Hopkins would later be the first commander in chief of the United States Navy. His brother Stephen signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Isaac Hopkins was the master of the Sally. You can see his wage, 50 pounds a month, plus a privilege. Slave ship captains were routinely given a privilege, which is a term used for the number of enslaved people they could sell on their own behalf. Standard privilege was three on 103, which meant for every 103 bodies you delivered alive, you could sell three on your own account. He, you will see, was offered a more liberal privilege. Again, I'll resist the temptation to parse this document. A letter of instruction from the Browns, proceed to the coast of West Africa and gather with quick dispatch a cargo of enslaved people to be sold on our behalf in the West Indies. Well, unfortunately for all, when the ship arrived, the coast of West Africa in 1764 was glutted with slave ships. Uh, in fact, 24 ships cleared from Rhode Island that fall alone. Here you see a couple of pages from the log book that Isaac Hopkins cook, kept, double entry bookkeeping, so that you can see precisely what was exchanged for being that was purchased in flasks of rum and powder, textiles, bars of iron, guns and cutlasses. Uh, this particular date, June 8th, I mean, it ultimately took Hopkins eight months to make his cargo which is to say that there were people enslaved and confined on that ship for eight months before it even left the coast of Africa. June 8th, a ship, a ship's longboat returned from a place called Jaba. And as you can see, he made several purchases. But if you look earlier in the left column that same day, a small notation, a Begua woman slave hanged herself between decks. Number two entered in the loss column. She was not the last. By the time the ship finally left West Africa on August 21st, 20 of the 196 people that Hopkins had purchased had died. And on the voyage home, as you can see, they continue to perish daily. On August 28th, a week out, slaves rose on us, was obliged to fire on them and destroyed eight and several more wounded back one badly, one thigh and one ribs broke, 25 to 32. This is the final page of the log book. The last 109th person to perish was a young man who actually perished en route to Providence from Barbados. We even found the bills of sale for those who were left at this time in Antigua where they were sold a standard price for a healthy male enslaved African was about 50 pounds. And you can see the prices that some of the people there are getting, uh, which gives you some sense of their physical condition. I found this document particularly moving. You will see that on this particular, at this particular auction, Alex Brody purchased a woman and child. That is the only time that the word child is used in all of these 200 manuscript pages. My assumption is that this was an infant born on the ship. Well, what does one do about that? Well, one of the things that was quite interesting is tracing the response of the Brown family. Three of the four brothers never again traded in slavers. One of them, Moses, the youngest, became an ardent abolitionist, a founder of the Providence Abolition Society, and one of the people whose agitation led not only to the abolition of slavery in Rhode Island, but to the abolition of slavery, first the slave trade, first from Rhode Island, and then in the United States as a whole. 
In fact, the first prosecution for illegal slave trading in United States history was a prosecution of John Brown brought by his brother, Moses. That is our historical legacy and it's hard to imagine any episode that brings to a point this ongoing struggle over slavery and freedom, over race and equality that remains now more than two centuries later, one of the fundamental struggles of our history. I leave to you to decide whether or not the recommendations that the committee forwarded were adequate. They included a, deep, a deepening of the relationship between Brown University and Providence Public Schools on the grounds that inadequate, inferior, disgustingly inadequate education was one of the primary legacies of slavery in our society. It included the creation of a dedicated center, the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, which you will have an opportunity to work at and conduct research with. It was dedicated not only to studying slavery, but other gross human rights violations, as well as the struggle to combat them and to repair the damage that they do. We also recommended, and you can visit it, a memorial. To my knowledge, the first real memorial to the transatlantic slave trade in the United States, which sits right outside of University Hall with that very simple statement of acknowledgement of a part of our past. I would like, however, to give the last word here to Ruth Simmons. Some colleagues and I recently published a book called Slavery in the University, which includes uh, an essay by President Simmons. And I would like just to end with this. At the end of her essay, she talks about what this experience meant to her as a descendant of enslaved people and also to universities. She writes, these reflections have particular resonance today in these perilous political times. I won't read it all. When there are people who challenge our freedoms, when demagogues and racists come to power with the support of substantial numbers of voters, when entire communities are harassed, demeaned and threatened, what could be more precious than our right to dissent? And dissent we must, raising our resonant voices to challenge hateful and divisive rhetoric, to denounce exclusionary practices. In the midst of this political turmoil, there is no greater mission for a university than to disclose facts, confront untruths, and uphold traditions of democracy, openness, and inclusion. Efforts by universities and other organizations to disclose truthfully their historical origins are consistent with these values. She goes on with this final note in the last paragraph, and I hope you will feel the same. Because of the work of the Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice, I have a fuller understanding of the historical legacy that I and other members of the Brown community inherited. That knowledge in no way compromises my esteem for the institution. To the contrary, I'm immensely proud of the legacy of Brown a legacy entangled with slavery, but also defined by independence of thought and action, a respect for dissent and a commitment to diversity. Perhaps most important, it is a legacy that affirms and confirms the human capacity to learn, change and grow. I welcome you to Brown and I hope that while you are here, you will also learn, change and grow. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much for that uh, detailed uh, introduction to the history of the report and, and for the, the statements to our incoming class. Uh, I wanna now turn it to Professor Anthony Bogues uh, and the director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dean. The, my remarks this afternoon really circle around confronting history, the past as a present tense. I want to thank uh, Anya as well as the Dean of the College, Rashid, for organizing this uh, event. 
I want to welcome the incoming class to Brown University and hope that your four years here, the four years here will be really very meaningful and that you will be able to engage in the study of difficult questions and also that you would leave here with the commitment to make a difference. You begin your undergraduate career at one of the most auspicious times in the life of our nation. We live in a moment of a pandemic, one of the most serious pandemics in, that we, have, we know of. The last one we had was the ninth of this magnitude, was in 1918. So that over 100 years ago, we, are, we now live in a moment in which a virus has affected all of us. We are on the same ship or on the same sea, but not necessarily sailing the same ship in this pandemic. The numbers are horrendous in the United States. 8.17 million persons are affected with over 220,000 deaths. Globally, we have 39.8 million folks who have been affected by the COVID-19 with deaths of over 1.2 million. Yet in the middle of this pandemic, what we saw was something remarkable. We saw emerging like flashes of illumination, almost like epiphanies. The la single largest protest demonstration in our history. Estimates put it that there are 26 million people who march and protest for months under the political banner of the Black Lives Matter movement. But this was not just an American phenomenon, a set of American protests. It was global. Over 400, over 4,000 cities across the world participated in demonstrations from Amsterdam to London, to Lagos in Nigeria, Glasgow in Scotland, to Paris, to Auckland in New Zealand, and to Sydney in Australia. In other words, what we witnessed was a global movement at a specific moment, marching and protesting under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Unfortunately, we also saw the emergence or it, or the beginnings of the emergence in the public center stage of armed militias. So all of this, pandemics, Black Lives Matter movements across America and in the world, and then the business of armed militias, all of this congealed to create a, a crisis in which we now live in. But what is one element of this crisis? The element of this crisis that I want to talk about is how Black Lives Matter shook the foundations of the racial order of America. And what does it mean to say that the racial order of America was shaken? America, as many of you know, was formed as a colony, not just as a British colony, but was formed as a colony of many European colonial powers. So that there was slavery in Florida in the 1520s, 1528, in where it was held by the Spanish. Then there was slavery by the Dutch. They held New York in 1626, where the Dutch West India Company brought the first slaves to New York. Then there were slaves in French Louisiana. And then in the British, British, uh, British um, middle colonies, there was in all the 13 colonies, uh, slavery. So that by the time you get to the American Revolution of 1776, what you are getting is a country that is uniting itself onto something called the American Republic. But in that unity, it is being defined, slavery is one of its defining features. So I think it is important to begin to understand that United States was founded by, founded in racial slavery. 
<clears throat> but was also founded in a second thing, which was called, which I would like to draw your attention to, which is the dispossession of the indigenous population. Now history, I would argue, is not just about events. It is not just about what happened. It is, but it also history is about the creation of structures and how these structures become part of our inheritance. We are all born in a society and that is not of our choosing where we are born. But the society that we are born in has a past, one that structures how we live in the present. It is not that the past is the present, but rather that the structures of the past shapes, not necessarily determines or overdetermines, but shapes our present, unless, unless we decide to confront that past. So here we have an American Republic in which racial slavery was a foundation in its formation. Not slavery, that was a simply Southern phenomenon as Professor Campbell has made clear, but slavery of, of, that, that embraced the entire nation. It was, there was slavery in the North so that the entire society was shaped by this business of racial slavery. Now, what is this thing of racial slavery? Because sometimes it seems so far away that we don't quite get it. And here I want to talk about, just refer you to perhaps one of the most important African-American intellectuals that I hope you will read while you are on campus here at Brown. That is Du Bois. Du Bois makes the point that racial slavery, he says in one of his just really many numerous books, that racial slavery or slavery, he says, is about a human being suffering under the domination of another human being's will. That I think is important. In other words, that it's slavery is about racial, uh, be, to be enslaved is that you have no capacity, you have no agency because you are under the domination of a human, another human being will. Slavery is also, means that it, the Africans who were here, and people, black people, were really what the historian Elsa Gavaya called being property in the purse in person. And so that they were, they were people who were considered property, but there were also properties, people who were considered property who produced commodities themselves. So it is like us, what I like to call sometimes a kind of double commodification. You yourself are property, you are self a commodity, but you are producing a certain Europe producing commodity itself that then goes towards the building up of United States and indeed of Europe itself. Slavery was also not just an aberration. This is something that people like to think about. Racial slavery was, some, was a system that was codified in law, codified in customs. And if you read it, if you look at it very, look at the various state laws, whether you're looking at Virginia or we're looking at uh, uh, South, South Carolina, what you will see were laws that govern the state and laws that govern the slaves in the state. Such a system, I would want to, uh, I would want to suggest to you, in which, the, in which you were under the will of somebody, in which you are a property, in which this system was governed by law and custom. Such a system, I would want to argue, meant that to be a black person was to be a slave and to be a slave was to be a black person. And that meant quite frankly, that what you had with the develop, with the emergence and consolidation of racial slavery, you had the creation of anti-black racism. But you also had the creation of something else because systems like slavery that would depend upon domination in which you are under the arbitrary will of somebody else has to be maintained and sustain themselves by fight by violence. Human societies which are founded in these kinds of dominations operate by violence. They cannot operate any other way. And therefore I want to suggest to you two things that you need to think about. One, the formation of anti-black violence, anti-black racism, and the ways in which 
violence sustained the system of racial slavery and how both anti-Black violence and anti-Black racism and violence then morph and kind of become what I would like to call sedimented deposits of our present time. We know that in 1865, that after a brutal civil war, that racial slavery was abolished. And we know that after that war, during the period of what is called Reconstruction, Black men were given the right to vote. We also know that slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment, in which made it, which made it clear that neither slavery nor servitude can happen except as a form of punishment um, for somebody who's duly convicted of a crime. It is interesting though to me that one of the most important abolitionists of the period, Frederick Douglass, in, in reflecting on the 13th Amendment made the point that this business of slavery can come back in another way. Because what he was trying to argue was that there was a paradox in that 13th Amendment, a paradox in which it says that slavery and servitude are, ab are abolished, but that if you have committed a crime, you can actually you, you, you can actually be enslaved or you can actually be done, and you can actually be um, the end, put in di different forms of servitude. So he gave a warning in one of his speeches about this 13th Amendment saying that one has to be, just be careful. Let's see whether or, whether or not it will come back and actually enslave us in different ways. We know that the reconstruction period that collapsed and that, uh, that as it collapsed, we saw the inauguration of Jim Crow, formal segregation, black codes, and of course, racial terror in forms of lynching. And therefore that by the late 19th and early 20th century, what, you were, what we began to see in this country is the consolidation of a racial order, but a racial order based upon what had already been there before. In other words, a racial order based upon slavery and, and, upon, and, and upon, upon violence. And so that when you think through the ways in which violence operates today, or think about anti-Black racism, you can talk about, we talk about slavery as the kind of almost original sin to use that language. But you also then have to think about how it morphs into Jim Crow and what kind of, what kind of practices were carried over in, in June, June Jim Crow, which, you know, which only ended formally in 1965, right? That 65, 64, we have to think about how those practices then help to actually shape the society in which we live in. Jim Crow, we know, was really, as I said, a formally abolished, and the practices of it, voting and equal rights and so on, by, the 60, by 1964 and, and, and 1965, uh, which is 100 years after the 18th, after 18, 1865. And, but, and so I want us to, to think about that kind of history and how that history shapes, what is it, where we are today. 2008, we all know, that there was a President Obama came into office, and many of us thought that this was the end of racial, racial subjugation, or at least anti-Black racism in the United States. We now know simply that that did not happen. And that did not happen because my argument is that the 1965 and 1964 Act, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, did not transform the fundamental structures that were born in slavery and that were actually um, re reorganized in, um, in, in, uh, in Jim Crow. So what you have around anti-Black racism is obviously an understanding of the Black body as a certain, as disposable, of the Black, of ordinary Black people not, near, not really being able to be integrated into the, into, in, into the body politic. And you can see this quite frankly, when you just look at the mass, the numbers around incarceration. Incarceration, if you look at it, look at it, mass incarceration, and you look at the figures, you will see that in 2008, the United States incarcerated four times more than any other country in the world, including South Africa at, 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 at its worst. Secondly, if you look at the questions of violence, you, we just have to recall George Floyd 
and Brianna Taylor. And we just have to recall the phrases of the, of, of the of black men who were saying, I can't breathe. We just have to look at public education. We have to look at access to healthcare. We have to look at the wealth gap in which in the, the, the studies of February um, 2016 say that the net worth of a white family is $171,000. The net worth of a black family of the same thing is $17,150. All these statistics are about lives of ordinary people. They are not simply data points, but they are about the expectations and the ways in which ordinary black lives are lived in America. So again, just to end by returning to the Black Lives Matter, the report and to Brown. The Black Lives Matter or the movement for black lives becomes the single most important movement in my view to actually tackle the living legacies of racial slavery, the unfinished business of the civil rights movement, the business of white supremacy, which continues to shape American life. The Slavery and Justice Report confronted our own history at Brown. It is part, it forms now part of our own, heri our own heritage. It is therefore a part in something that lays a foundation for us to begin to think about anti-racism itself, to think about how to confront the history of America with this and, and what and to think about the stories which we tell ourselves. The slavery and justice report now allows us, because it creates a different ground, a different platform, to grapple with the past in order to grapple with the present so that we can think about creating a different future. How we do this, we as the undergraduates and folks at Brown and you as the undergraduate uh, community, sometimes uh, who, are, who I consider having taught here at Brown for nearly 20 years now, as some of the brightest and best young people in our country. How you do that is the, the ways in which you begin to engage in a set of activities, which will continue to transform Brown and to actually enlarge the inheritance which we now have from the slavery and justice report. In confronting our own history, we create the possibilities of our present. The slavery and justice report has laid the ground for us to create those new possibilities. Thank you all very much and welcome, welcome to Brown. Thank you very much, Tony, Professor Bogues, and Jim, Professor Campbell. We have some time for a few questions and we receive questions from the audience uh, in advance of the event and also the Q&A is open if people wanted to add some. I wanted to just start off um, th this reading uh, will be tremendously difficult for our students. Um, and the depth of knowledge that one would hope to acquire around this issue is, is enormous. Uh, Tony, in, in your presentation, you spoke about um, Du Bois. Um, I have a question is, what would you recommend, what would you encourage our students to read together with the report? How can they help to augment their learning around this topic um, and that could be either for you, Jim, or for you, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, there's a really very important book, which um, Jim, I'm sure, has will have many suggestions that I find very useful. Um, and it's by a man called Vincent Hardin, and it's called There's a River. Um, it's not a complicated book to read. He writes very well. You can sit down and read it at a, at a at a, at a couple of sittings. And uh, Vincent is a, Af was a real Af was an African American scholar and was, a, and was a close confidant of Martin Luther King. Um, and one of, and the, the, the beauty of that book is the way in which it discusses slavery, but also in which it talks about the, the, the activities of those persons who were enslaved and begins to therefore map a different, um, a different genealogy, a different way, a different archive in which we can begin to think about, uh, in which we can begin to think about freedom. The second book I would want to suggest is by W.B. Du Bois, um, and it's called Souls, simply called Souls of Black Folks. 
Um, it's a book I think that many, many, it's on, it's on the introductory um, course list, I'm sure of Africana studies, um, but it is, it is a remarkable text, it's written in 1903. Um, but it is also a, a text that opens up a whole set of questions about what does it mean to be black? What is the African American experience in um, in United in in, uh, in United States? Those are two books I would want to I would want to, to I'd want to mention. The other thing I would want to mention very quickly is actually not a book, but, a, but you can find them in um, in George James's um, Reader and Angela Davis, uh, <clears throat> which is that at the back of that Reader are two remarkable essays given, uh, lectures given by Angela Davis on freedom. Um, they were given when she was, uh, she was, she was not yet a tenured professor at uh, University of California, in University of California system, but they are just simply remarkable, um, I think, because they again open up a space for us to think about slavery or slavery, but also to think about freedom. And I think, and I think you have to be able to think about both. You know, let me just quickly jump in on that. I mean, I, I, I would agree with those recommendations. The other person to throw in, I think, who's become extraordinary, who reverberates extraordinarily powerfully in our own moment is James Baldwin. But um, the other thing I would say, what, what Professor Bogues just did in reminding us that to think about slavery is also to think about freedom. I think one of the things I guess I would advise each of you as you're developing your own curricula is not to think about these questions as being something that sits out here in one portion of the university or there's a couple departments or maybe I should take a course in this, but to recognize that the fundamental questions that are being asked in this field, the fundamental questions that are being posed in the slavery and justice enterprise about what it means to, to live in community, what it means to be a human being and to inherit historical legacy, some of which are grievous and some of which are gracious, and how we live responsibly and ethically and mindfully in that world. I think you can bring those preoccupations, that point of view to virtually everything you study at Brown. So think of this, please, not as something that sits out as a kind of separate field that you should dabble into or make sure that you get a little exposure to to recognize that the questions that Africana studies is asking of us, the question the slavery, the slavery and justice initiative is asking of us should suffuse the entirety of your education, both inside and outside the classroom. Great, thank you both very much for that. Um, another question that came in um, through the registration was, what do you think were the most impactful um, parts of the report and the report writing process? Either one of you can take that. Let me, let, let me defer to the, to the person who chaired the committee first. And then I'll <laughs> well, look, I, I think in terms of what's most impactful, I mean, part of what we tried to do in the recommendations was, first of all, make recommendations that were consonant with Brown's identity as an educational institution. But we also tried to do things in the present, right? You, you know, a memorial is a beautiful and meaningful thing. I don't mean to dismiss it, but ultimately we care about transforming the ways in which we understand the past because we seek to alter the matrix of political possibility in the present. So I would say that uh, the work that this has spawned, the connections that Brown has had with Hope High School and with, uh, children in Providence public schools to try to make a meaningful difference in that, you know, in confronting one of the legacies of slavery. I think that's highly impactful. And I think that that's something that virtually every student listening to this presentation can do. In terms of the moments in ter of, of writing that were most meaningful to me, I had an experience, I got a email one day from one of Brown's archivists saying, hey, you know, we have a whole bunch of you know, student commencement addresses and stuff like this that are about this, uh, about the touch on slavery, should I send them to you? And I said, sure. And I remember I was sitting at my desk like two in the morning one night and I think I've got to read these. So I ended up reading this commencement address from the 1790s by a student named James Talmadge, a Brown student who later became a Congressman from New York and whose proposal that 
for ab abolishing slavery in Missouri prompted the Missouri Compromise was really the beginning of the sectional crisis. And you've got to imagine he's sitting there addressing a group of trustees and board members that include some of the pro most prominent slave traders in the United States. And he says, I take as my subject this gross immoral traffic of slave trading. And he runs through the arguments that are made on behalf of slave trading and demolishes them. It's just fearless. And it's so brown, right? It's a brown student speaking truth to power. But at the end, he, the last example he picks up of a specious argument that's adduced in, on behalf of slave trading is he says this, this crazy idea we have that a person of dark pigment is somehow, or of light pigment is somehow superior to a person of dark pigment. He says, you know, the, a, a principle that if taken to its logical conclusion would leave us all subject to a puny albino. But he goes on to say then, this is a subject that people seriously in this day and age can argue that is a subject for future generations to investigate. And that was a moment where I felt a Brown student over 200 years before had put a little message in a bottle and we picked it up on the shore. And that for me was a profound moment. Yeah, I think very quickly, Anya, um, the, the impact of the report is obviously the following. One, the ways in which the, the other universities have picked up on the matter. Um, they create the, the different universes all over the United States and some of them quite frankly outside of the United States that have followed that model. So that's as one um, university said, has said to, to us that we are like the gold standard in terms of trying to, to think about how to, how to do this. I think after the report, what is important is that what Jim says to Hope High School, but I think there is something about the about the report which I think is important, um, and that is the we to think how do we think about doing history for in ways which raise that history to the level where it can be understood not just by a group of historians but can be engaged with by ordinary people. And to me, that is really very, very, very important because the question of slavery is not an issue for academics alone. We do the research, we, et cetera, et cetera, we need to do it. But the question of slavery is about the structures of this society and indeed the structure, I would argue, of the globe and, and, and modernity. Um, and so how do you do the, how do you do history, which allows, which is, which allows therefore for exhibitions, for, um, for public humanities, for what some of us call public history, to, be, to become a terrain, to become a set of, uh, to become a, a, a venue or a terrain really, yeah, a terrain in which what? In which you can then begin to engage ordinary people about this. Because what I, one of the things that I, what I will never forget is, is how the American Historical Association um, when they, um, under the presidency of Ira Berlin, when the Atlantic slave trade database came out and that they, a group of historians were going to meet just outside DC to discuss it in a church. And then when they, you know, when, when they got there, they found that the place was full of ordinary people who had heard. And it struck me that, one, and that they had to hire Ira Berlin, you know, the late Berlin, remarkable historian, understood what was happening and switched the agenda. But it struck me on that story that he tells always strikes me as making it clear to us in United States that this thing is not just for the walls of the university at all. So what we try and do at the center is to make sure that, as we said, we are, we are a scholarly institution with public humanities mission. And I think that's one of the real impacts of the report, to think about how to do scholarship with public history and public humanities. My, friend, my, my thing about something that is impactful is something that Professor Campbell may remember. Every, we are an academic institution. We academics, we argue, and we have our own different point of views. And sometime, somewhere in this process, one of the things that happened was that it became clear to us that we could not unite on the report. 
and I remember having discussions with Professor Campbell and, and then Brenda Allen about this. And we were thinking about, okay, we need to probably do a majority report and a minority report because we just couldn't find a way to actually say what the single report was. And so we had a meeting with Dr. Simmons. It was a dinner meeting. And we said kind of where you are, you know, what's happening, where, you know, what kind of status report. And we said to her, well, listen, we think we are not going to be able to do a, a complete report or kind of consensus, consensus support that we're gonna to have to ever give you a minority and a majority report. And she looked at us with a smile and she said, I can't tell you all what to do. You're all faculty and so on. And I will never dare to tell you what to do. But what I will tell you is that if you produce two reports, a minority and a majority report, you'd have failed in your job. And I remember we all looked at each other at the dinner table and in our very next meeting kind of, as we would say, went back to the drawing board to try and think about, okay, what do we, how do we do this thing? But it also emphasized to me that what we were doing was not simply an ac academic exercise, that we were, as she was actually trying to force us to model a certain kind of democratic practice and democratic debate for the issue that is of singular importance to the nation. So that, that, that's something I've always taken. I, I, you know, I've kept it always in the back of my head. Thank you so much. And thank you again to Professors Campbell and to Professors Bowes for your time today. And thank you all for attending. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right, thank you very much, Anya. Thank you, Dean. Take care of yourself and welcome you all to Brown again. Bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful time in these next four years. Thank you.